So you planned an encounter according to CR. The numbers look right, but here you are and your party is pretty much headed towards a TPK. They're all dying. It's not what you planned, but you're in it now. What do you do? Or have you ever planned a deadly encounter? Something that you hoped would have a little bit of narrative impact on your party. Maybe it touches one of your party members' backstory or deals with the BBEG. And your party just delivered 300 hit points worth of damage to your monster. You weren't ready for it and your encounter is falling a little flat. Boring. I am here to introduce my flex encounter methodology to save your day or to save your encounter. To save you, the DM. <laughs> I see what you did there. If you're watching this video, you probably know what a TPK is, but just in case you don't, it is total party kill. That is when the DM delivers some sort of encounter and the result is that the entire party is killed. Why do you think TPKs happen? We're going to dig into that in just a minute. Personally, I believe that everyone should experience a TPK in one form or another at some point in their tabletop gaming life. That being said, flex encounters is my method for you to be able to avoid that on the fly. So if we're to talk about whose fault it is when it comes to TPKs, I think it is the CR's fault, the challenge rating. It's meant to be a guide for the DM when they're planning the encounters. The rule of thumb is that four level six players should be able to handle one level six CR monster, and it should feel like a medium difficulty encounter. The problem with CR is that CR does not take into account your party's inventory or lack of inventory. It doesn't take into account the party composition, whether or not there's a cleric or a rogue or a druid. It doesn't take into account your player's tactics whether they're new or whether they're seasoned and very experienced, it doesn't take into account good and bad dice rolls. Imagine this scenario. So your party is in a carnival setting. It's at night and a griffin breaks free of its enclosure. It causes havoc, maybe injuring, killing, or maiming carnival goers or carnival workers. The party attacks. All of a sudden, for some reason, the party attacks or defends themselves. Before you know it, almost the entire party is down and there is one person left. What would you do? Would totally destroy Frodo! There are some ways that you can adjust this encounter mid-battle and your players won't even know that you did it. Firstly, you should give the monster a narrative reason to leave. So get out of here! Scram! Ah! Consider your party is fighting some sort of beast. What if that beast hears its babies calling off in the distance? And now the monster's priority is no longer destroying the party. It is now, I need to get to my babies. What if it hears some sort of mating call and it just happens to be Griffin mating season? You could also have some bigger, scarier creatures show up and scare the Griffin off. You have to be careful with this one because that creature needs to also leave if you're going to save your party from a TP. So make sure that bigger, scarier monster goes chasing after the griffin. Now, if your party is fighting not a beast, maybe they're fighting some kind of humanoid, these same tactics can be used. You just need to flip the narrative a little bit. Instead of hearing their babies calling and they need to leave, perhaps your humanoid enemy gets some sort of message through mental brainwaves that the party is not privy to what is being spoken. The minions are saying, you need to come back to our lair. There's something bad happening. And we have no control over it. Somebody help us! The bad guy then leaves. I'm not sure if a mating call would be appropriate for a humanoid enemy, but if you like it, use it. Hey, that's the blue belly kingfish's mating call. When it comes to scaring your humanoid enemy off, guards usually do the trick. If an enemy is outnumbered, they tend to retreat. <laughs> Use the terrain. And by that, I'm not meaning like physical terrain that you have made, if that's what you do. I mean, whatever the environment is, the surroundings, the weather, the time of day, use the environment that the players are fighting in to your advantage. Or I guess it would be to their advantage if you're saving them from a TPK. The volcano where they're fighting, whatever section the monster is standing on, the rocks begin to start crumbling and the players notice, or you tell the players, hey, this monster is about to fall 
fall into the lava. The, the place where the monster is standing is going to collapse any minute. Perhaps they're fighting in an icy mountain and you can relay to the party that when there's some loud enough noise from your battle that some of the ice and snow from the mountain begins to kind of crack and crumble and you can see little tiny snowballs that start to form, maybe giving them the idea to cause an avalanche to cover the monster. If you're in a cave, there could be a collapse. If you're in a forest, there could be a huge giant tree that falls on the monster. If you're on the open plains, there could be winds that form. And then next thing you know, the monster is carried off by a tornado or at least knocked over and prone. If you're in an ocean, a whirlpool could suddenly develop and suck the monster down. The key here is to telegraph at least one round in advance that something is about to happen. This way, your players don't feel that you have deus ex machina their survival. Let me deus ex machina this shit and let's go home. Give your players perception checks. For what? Just about anything. Anything that might be helpful to them. For example, whoever remains standing, tell them to give you a perception check. Whoever rolls highest, you can explain to them that the monster they're fighting, they notice that one of the knee joints or elbow joints seems to be kind of swollen and maybe a little distorted, giving them the impression that there is an old wound that has been inflamed. If the party goes for it and they try to attack the old wound, give them double damage or make that the killing blow. You can also give your monsters some additional vulnerabilities. You can relay the information that they saw. There's an old scar on its side that looks to be some kind of a slashing wound that never quite healed right. And perhaps that might give them the idea that if they use slashing weapons, they will deal more damage. And guess what? If they do start using slashing weapons, let them do the double damage. Also, if they go for the wound that you have explained to them, you could also reduce the AC on that. Make it easier to hit. Be careful about removing established abilities. If your party has already hit it with fire and you've already told them that the monster is resistant to fire, don't then go changing it so that now when they hit them with fire, it does regular or full damage. But you can give your monster some other vulnerability. You can explain to them that while the fire damage seems to be doing something, you now get the feeling that maybe something a little more direct like lightning, something a little more concise might do more damage. If they pass a perception check, you might be able to tell them that they see some sort of magic item on the field or some old potions that are just lying around have toppled out of some sort of supplies hiding under a bush. It doesn't even have to be a healing potion. It could be some other interesting potion like a potion of flying, a potion of giant strength. They won't know. If they are desperate and in a dire situation, they may not care and it could be fun. Maybe they see some sort of an escape route or some place to hide that the monster can't reach. Perhaps they see some kind of a trap. Oh, you rolled a 20 on your perception check? Gee, it's funny, there happens to be a rope right here that leads up and over the tree, and look, there's some kind of a heavy sack hanging from the tree. And oh, look, the monster happens to be right under the sack. It doesn't necessarily have to be quite that obvious, but you might be able to give them some idea of some trap in the environment that they can use against the enemy. This also includes some sort of elemental hazard or again, use the environments and the surrounding areas as something that might be able to be used against the monster. You could also create some sort of distraction or diversion for your party. And what I mean by this is you're going to put something in play that splits the monster's attention. You could have another party arrive. Maybe this party has been tipped off on what your party is doing and they want to get to the loot first or they want to complete the quest first. They jump in. You could have guards show up. Whatever the distraction is, the intent isn't to take care of the encounter for the party. It's not to end the encounter in such a way that they swoop in and take away from the party, your party that is doing the quest. The intent is to take the attention off of your party momentarily, long enough so that your party can have a breather, can recuperate, can think about ways to escape. You can also give your party some additional hints and clues. Try to telegraph what the monster's vulnerabilities are. Start this as soon as you notice that the encounter is going downhill. Earlier, I said something similar, but that was giving your monster some other vulnerability and then telegraphing it to your players. This is making sure that you're relaying existing information to your players that they may not already have. This is not altering the monster. This is just telegraphing what we already know. It's different. 
Now, you could use the party's experience, knowledge, and expertise to tap into who gets this knowledge. Hey, Druid, you read a book about unicorns once. You remember or you recall that they are immune to being charmed. Hey, Rogue, remember that backstory of yours that included an air elemental that your parents had down in the basement? Because of that, now that you're fighting an air elemental, you remember that they're resistant to lightning. Or you can use whoever in your party has the highest perception, highest insight, highest nature, highest medicine, whatever the check might be that can rationalize the information you're about to give them, tap into that. Hey, Paladin, you notice because you have the highest perception, you notice that that Zorn that you're fighting is not using eyesight to detect your location. You realize that it was facing away from you and yet when you moved, you could see some little twitch, some movement, body language that tells you that it knows you are are moving even though it can't see you. That will at least give the party some information like maybe this creature has blind sight or tremor sense. Yeah, yeah, I could take a hint. Do this as soon as you see that the party is having some kind of difficulty because you want time enough to be able to telegraph those hints and clues and give the party time enough to try to figure it out on their own. If the enemy can communicate in any way, and by this I mean not just words coming out of the mouth, there could be sign language, there could be body language, mannerisms, even telepathy. If there is any way that your enemy can communicate, try to give the party a chance to negotiate for their own lives or even surrender. And if you're feeling particularly devilish, use your enemy's communication to taunt and tease them. Foolish mortals, how dare you try me? You are but weaklings. Come back later when you are more powerful. <laughs> and then bamf out. It may seem silly in the moment, but trust me, your party is going to take that so personally that when they come across that enemy again, they will mean business. I'm gonna kick your ass. Now that we have some idea how to flex this encounter, let's revisit the scenario. So we have a carnival setting. We have an escaped griffin that has broken free of its cage and is going on a rampage. Your party goes in to attack or defend themselves. Four party members are down and there is one left standing. A TPK is imminent. What can you do to help your party out? Some ideas I've come up with. Looking at this griffin, I was already inspired with the idea. It has this kind of of bent elbow, bent claw. I would imagine that if we came down to one player, I would then telegraph, you're realizing now that you are up front and close with this monster that there is something wrong with its paw. And then let them make their assumptions. And if they attack the paw, let it do double damage, let it maim the creature so that the encounter can soon be over. Its wing could be injured, or maybe in the attack, you now telegraph that its wings are now injured and now it cannot fly. Maybe that at least decreases the difficulty a little bit, especially if the lone player that's left is a melee fighter and has no way to access a flying creature. I can't reach here. You could have another creature escape from the carnival, something bigger, something meaner, maybe a chimera. It chases off the griffin and goes after it. Maybe you start describing that wind has been picking up. You can hear the carnival tents flapping and all of a sudden the top off one of the carnival tents flies off and lands on the griffin. I can't stop. Oh. This doesn't end the encounter, but it gives your lone player long enough to maybe heal up another player or get the other characters out of there. Whatever it is, it's a distraction. Smoke bomb. It looks like there's a lot of stuff lying around, crates and maybe some supplies. So what if this player saw some potions lying about? Or you could have a stack of crates that falls and lands on the creature and damages it. At least that's some additional damage to help your player so that when they deal their next blow, they don't question why the creature goes down. That sounds a little too coincidental. But Amber, you ask, what if I need to adjust this encounter to be even more difficult instead of less difficult? Difficult. I'm absolutely evil. Have you ever planned an encounter and you wanted it to be deadly? You wanted it to hit home and you really wanted your players to struggle. And the party just breezed right on through. The monster should have put up more of a fight and yet two rounds later, it's about to die. This can be really frustrating for the players and the DM, especially if this encounter falls on some sort of narrative beat like a player's backstory or involves the BBEG. You really want those moments to have impact, but they just fall flat. This is almost too easy. 
You can flex encounters to raise the stakes. The standard advice for this is to add some extra enemies or add extra hit points to your encounter. I would call this a decent option. It's an easy fix and you wouldn't need any additional types of minis or tokens. You can just keep reusing the same one. You can also kind of decide this mid encounter and you can keep adding extra enemies or extra HP until you feel that the party's had enough. The problem with this is that it can get get boring really fast. And when I say really fast, it can get boring in the same encounter. Boring. Your players will kind of see right through this and they will just feel that all you're doing is giving them a sack of hit points to hit. Now, if this is the decent or good option, let's see what a better option would be. I propose that if you're going to add more enemies, add enemies of a different type. What I mean by this is if your party is fighting some kind of monster that is a ground based monster, then instead of throwing extra monsters of that same type, throw in a flying monster or two. This basically forces your party to start thinking of the landscape in 3D, including elevation. They're no longer worried about what's right in front of them. They now have to worry about what's above them as well. And they might have to consider how can they get up there to attack the thing that is flying. If they're fighting something that's really big, one big monster, throw in a bunch of tiny minion monsters, if you will. If they're fighting some big giant monster, throw in a bunch of little one hit point monsters, if you will, a bunch of them, because now they're having to really consider their movement economy and each player can be surrounded by like four or five different enemies. They're not deadly by any means, but they definitely take up some brain power when it comes to each player's turn and what they're going to do. If they're fighting some kind of a melee type monster, make sure you throw in additional monsters that can induce some kind of magical effects. Again, this forces your party to really start thinking strategically and worry about their defenses as well as their attacks. So if this is a better option, is there a best option? I say yes. Let's take this a step further and add enemies of a different type that also add conditions. If your enemy can inflict blindness or incapacitate the party or make them unconscious, stun them. These are all an additional layer of tactics that your party is now forced to consider. Again, thinking about their defenses and less about their offense, they have to make that balance when it comes to their turn. It adds an extra layer of decision making for them. You can also enhance your enemy's abilities on the spot. For example, if they're fighting some kind of a beast that has a bite and a claw attack, add an additional bite or claw attack. Or maybe you can change it up a bit so it doesn't feel a little boring. Does your monster have a tail? Well, guess what? They now have that bite and claw attack and they get a tail attack or a wing attack. When it comes to damage, just deal similar damage. If the bite attack does 1d6 plus four, then so does the tail or so does the wing. Your players aren't gonna be aware of the math behind it and it will feel fair to them. Just make sure not to tack on 10d10 damage for this additional attack, unless it makes sense. You can also give your monster an additional ability. Invisibility is a great one because then the players have to consider what they're going to do when they can't see the enemy. Do they hold their attack? Do they still try to attack even though it's invisible? They have to consider what they're going to do while you get to move around the map unseen. You could also give your monster some kind of a powered up attack or healing and regeneration or spell casting. These three options, I would make sure that again, you telegraph in advance so that it doesn't feel cheap. Give them a round where you describe that you can see the monster's throat is starting to glow, this blue magical energy, it's building and building, and they're gonna wonder what's coming. Oh my gosh, what's coming? And then when the monster does this lightning ray out of its mouth, you can do that 10d10 damage and it will make sense to them. Holy mother of Jehoshaphat! Give your enemy some additional resistances. Describe what the party sees. The monster's skin begins to glow and shimmer, or scales start to form from the back and start leading towards the front. What does it mean? They won't know until it's too late, and now the monster has resistance to slashing damage. Or maybe it's resistance to fire damage. Or maybe it's bumped up its AC by two because it's additional shielding on its skin. You could also give your enemy advantages on attacks or saving throws or impose disadvantage on the party when they attack the monster. This I would be very 
be careful of. You don't want to overuse it or make it too OP. So try to keep it in line with what current mechanics are. I would probably take a look at some other monsters that are in that same category or same level and see what you could play with so that it doesn't feel unfair. What? I would never! Now you could give your monsters some improvement on their tactics. This is especially helpful when you have those monsters that you use that are dumb, instinctual, creature type monsters. They aren't supposed to be smart enough to know that when they encounter a party, go after the wizard because the wizard has less hit points and the wizard's not very strong. And, and if I hit the wizard, it'll go down. Well, I take offense. I could be dangerous too. Those creatures wouldn't necessarily know that. That. Instinctual creatures would probably attack the person that's closest or the person that's threatening them the most. What you can do is you can make one of your monsters smart. Imagine that your party is fighting a group of giant apes. After one or two rounds, when you realize that this encounter is just a little too easy, have one of your apes make some kind of communicative motion, pounding on its chest, calling out, or maybe it takes its turn to run to two or three of the other animals and do some kind of grunting noises. Okay. You know that this creature is smart and is communicating to the others, hey, I hit that wizard or I see that guy, he looks skinny, go after that guy. Whatever the tactic might be that you want to incorporate, just kind of role play it out that it's communicating to the others. To justify it, describe that one as looking a little different. Now that could be is its physical appearance looks a little bit different. Slight, maybe it's, it's a different color. It has scales where the other one doesn't. It has some kind of weird wire protruding out of its head. Maybe its mannerisms are different. Maybe it walks on two legs like a person, but the other ones don't. Whatever that may be, that difference is enough to rationalize to your party that there's something different here that they don't understand. Wait a minute. Maybe it was raised by humans. Maybe it was a lab experiment. How it's smart or the why it's smart is not important during the battle. And you can figure that out later when you have some time. Give yourself layer actions. Just as we can use the environment to prevent a TPK, we could also use the environment to help us out a little bit to make things difficult for your players. Make sure to choose layer actions that make sense for the environment or battle map or location that they're in. If your party's fighting in a volcano, add a layer action where lava spurts up and everyone has to make dexterity saving throws or take lava damage. If they're fighting in a snowy terrain, make sure that you communicate to them that an avalanche could occur if there's something loud that happens and then everybody has to make dexterity saving throws or be buried under the snow or they take some kind of falling rock damage from rocky, icy rocks. Those are things. She's really smart. These layer actions can do damage or they can just make things a little bit more challenging for your players. They can create difficult terrain. They could create some kind of a fog that obscures sight. These also don't have to be ongoing for every round the way layer actions normally work. You can make it one and done just enough to help you out or you can use it every round or if you can find a way narratively, you can try to do it for so many rounds until you feel that you don't need to do it anymore and then stop using layer actions. The point is to give you the DM enough time to figure out maybe your next plan of attack. I'm sure you've seen it on Critical Role and other such live play shows. You can make your creatures and your monsters legendary. Legendary! And what I mean by this is you're giving them legendary actions, reactions, and resistances. Have your monster take an additional action outside of its turn or reaction. You could also just choose to make a saving throw. You want to make sure that you're following the standards for legendary creatures when you do this. So make sure that you look up other similar creatures in that category or in that level. If they only have one of each, make sure that you give yours one of each. If they have three of each, then great, go for it. You definitely don't want to bypass more than what is standard or else it will feel unfair to your players. The whole purpose of my flex encounters methodology is so that you don't have to plan. It doesn't mean that you 
can't plan. Aside from unexpected one-shots that you are running, you can incorporate this into your already existing campaign. You will already have some idea what locations your players might head and what encounters they might encounter. So use my flex methodology to notate a few ways that you can increase the difficulty of your encounter and decrease the difficulty of your encounter so that you have them ready and you don't have to stress. You now have everything that you need to be able to flex your encounters up or down with or without notice. I hope you found this helpful. If you want to learn how to create a one shot on the fly with absolutely no preparation, watch this video here and thanks for watching.